supposed to simulate a uh, plug in like a gunshot wound. Oh, no so way. So it will, it will pump like blood out. It seemed like everyone knew what they were doing, especially, mm -hmm. you know, the cops, they were throwing tourniquets on people. So, I mean, at the end of the day, you have to think that they're just people too. And, mm -hmm. and it could be your brother, your sister, your, your mom or dad. So you got to treat them all the same. Um, but we do f have to force an individual to go to the hospital and go on a 72 hour hold. It was the height of you know, with all the George Floyd stuff going on. Yeah. So it seemed like, you know, it's not the right time to be a cop at that time. Welcome back to another episode of the PT Lounge. My name is Austin Madriaga. I'm a licensed and practicing physical therapist um, in Las Vegas. This podcast is all about interviewing healthcare providers, talking about their life and their career. On this episode, it's a little bit different. My guest today um, isn't directly um, connected to a, as a healthcare provider. However, he is a frontline worker. I want to introduce my guest today, Jan, who is a police officer. So we're going to dive deep into your career. So welcome to the podcast. I appreciate you coming on. Thanks for having me. That was actually a really impressive introduction. <laughs> yeah. You just you just flipped the switch just like that. that yeah. Was, that was really impressive. <laughs> yeah. I'm getting used to it a little bit. Before we get started, um, I just want to know you a little bit more. Yeah. Could you just talk about you know who you are and what you do? Sure. Uh, first and foremost, I'm a I'm a father, a husband, and um, my job I would say is a law enforcement in uh, Southern Nevada. And yeah, thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah, of course. Let's go back to kind of how it all started. What made you want to be a law enforcer? Yeah, um, I served in the military for uh, just a little bit over seven years, and I guess I missed that you know that camaraderie that that you have with people. And I guess it's, I don't know, I think it's always been in my blood that want to serve and kind of cliche to say is yeah. uh, protect other people. Right. And I guess this was the job for me, even no matter my parents said, don't do it, but yeah, it it's made me happy, so. Yeah. So what was the transition like from serving in the military to trying to get into um, the police officer role? Yeah, so I, the transition was pretty easy because it's, it's really militant uh, it's in the structure yeah um your day-to-day -day, you know you wear a uniform you gotta obey certain orders and you have a set of rules that you can't you know mm -hmm. you can't step out of your boundaries right uh, so it was, it was a pretty easy transition yeah but i was actually working as a, um, a special education uh paraprofessional at the time oh, so i was okay. working out of school for a little bit and then um yeah uh i was just about to finish my bachelor's degree yeah. for criminal justice and then I, I applied okay how was that application like uh, i was really very rigorous. long yeah. yeah i mean you wouldn't want like some convict or something yeah. like that to you know to apply you gotta be stuff. clean you gotta yeah. know why you want to be there yeah i'm sure you gotta go through like a polygraph and you gotta go through a psychological exam so it was a pretty tedious i think it was eight months until until they gave me like a like a job offer and then i okay. took it so you got a job offer. What was that position? What was your first like? Uh, it was as a police recruit. So you don't get that title right away. You got to go through an academy, which I believe it's about six months long. Okay. Yeah. So you got to go through that academy and then you become a police officer and then you got to, you got to ride with a, what they call a field training officer for mm. another half a year okay. so that they could show you the ropes, kind of like a on the job training type of thing too. Yeah. And then after those six months, you get to just be on your own. Yeah. Essentially? yeah, I mean, you're still on like a probation period. So, you oh. know, they're, they're still watching you really closely. But yeah, okay. you get to spread your wings a little bit. Yeah. So the position that you're in right now, how long have you been in this, this um, role? Came in around 2020. So just about hitting three years. Coming up three years. Yep. Yeah. It goes by really fast. Yeah. And you worked through the pandemic then, huh? I, I would say so. Not not right when it started i would say in the middle of it we were still wearing masks and all that stuff that, that was a little difficult to go through but yeah definitely um so this podcast is all about diving deep into the medical side of things mm -hmm. so i want to focus a little bit on that what kind of medical training did you have or do to yeah. be in the position that you're in so so prior becoming a law enforcement officer i was um i went to emt school i i, I thought i wanted uh, to be a firefighter okay so that's 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 a funny story, but yeah. Anyways, yeah. So I went through EMT school beforehand. Um, that was a few years before I even thought about being a police officer. So I have a, that that background at least. Okay. Um, but the academy, we go through basic, um, what does it say, uh, emergency response, um, 
So we, we, in our cars, we would have like a trauma kit and that trauma mm-hmm. kit, you'd have, um, tourniquets, um, they have funny names for some of these things. Yeah. Like the sucking wound, chest, <laughs> chest seals or stuff, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So we have, we have those. So basically if people get like stab or shot, mm-hmm. like we be able to tend to them quickly. Yeah. And I'm sure you've gone through simulations of medical Mm -hmm. situations, right? What were some of those trainings like? Was it pretty nerve wracking to start? So yeah, so at least we're we're lucky to have like a like a I would say like a a building dedicated to us um, where we can train those things, and they have like you know those Bob dummies. Like, you know, if you take martial arts, you have those, like, yeah. those dummies. So they have one where it, like, lays down and you're supposed to simulate, uh, plug in, like, a gunshot wound. Oh, no so way. So it will, it will pump, like, blood out. <laughs> yeah. And you have to, like, stick your finger in there and, like, plug, like, a legit hole and Dang. start putting bandages in it. So, yeah, yeah, you get your hands dirty with the, like, That's the pretty cool. sticky blood and all that stuff. The furthest I've done is just, like, a CPR course where there's, like, a half-body dummy oh, just yeah, doing yeah. the compression. So it's basically like that, but it's in, like, a bathtub. Oh. And then they pump like uh, like fake blood, so it's like you get you get pretty dirty. Yeah, it could be like a pass or fail thing, where no, if no, you no they just like they just want you to you. go through the motions, be like, this is what's gonna feel like. You're gonna get really dirty. Yeah. So um, when you went through that training, did you expect uh, like real life situations to be completely different, or like did they train you to where they were like, this is how it's gonna be like? It's gonna be very stressful. Like, were you prepared um, for they it? They don't say that. I think we just all go in the mindset that it might happen one day and it's probably going to happen. Yeah. But I don't think any of us sit there and be like, hey, this is probably going to happen next week. Yeah. A lot of it just is kind of like we're trained on it and then you go through a normal day and then shit hits the fan and then you yeah. got to you gotta perform. Yeah. So going back to that like gunshot wound training, mm-hmm. let's just go right into it. Have you ever responded to a call and it was a gunshot wound and you personally had to help yeah so there was one i would say about a year ago um i was working graveyard um and there was a call that came out that there was a shooting it was actually outside the the area that i was uh, patrolling Mm. and uh my nosy self turned to that that uh you know that that area and, and i could hear all these guys like saying there's 30 people shot, there's 50 people shot, and they're like, wow. they're running all over the place. So I get on the phone, I call my sergeant, I'm like, hey, can, like, you know, they're down the street, can we go help them out? And he goes, yeah, sure. So we go head over there, and it's at this um, unsanctioned, like, hookah lounges. Oh. And apparently it's like a gangbanger hookah lounge, yeah. and it was someone's birthday, and someone shot up the place. So Man. we get there, and medical's kind of holding short because, the, you know, they need us to go in there first, and then we find at least nine people with gunshot wounds so everyone's sitting there throwing tourniquets on people bloods all over the place there's like a guy with his brains out oh my <laughs> so, gosh yeah so yeah so we, we threw a few tourniquets at, at at some people um our job is not to stop it right there is mm-hmm. for you know to extend the their life so that we can take them to a hospital and that's when they can get the proper treatment yeah so I'm sure having experience as an EMT mm-hmm. plays a big role in that right because yeah. now you know when you respond to that call Mm -hmm. you know when you see emt you know their job yeah and then now you know your job so you can kind of work together Mm -hmm. is it easier then to kind of hand off the care to an an emt because you already know what they do just to be just to be clear i just got my certification i never actually worked as a as an emt so oh okay so being a police officer is the first practice or application i've had in in a like first aid okay um but since I knew what they were capable of, then I, you know, yeah. I trust that they know more. They have they have way more equipment than we do. Yeah. How did you handle that just mentally, like responding to that call where there's nine gunshot wounds confirmed? Um, I think I handled it pretty well. I mean, mentally, too, because it seemed like everyone knew what they were doing, especially, mm-hmm. you know, the cops. They were throwing tourniquets on people. Uh, we had um, great leaders telling us where to go and all that. And we saw the firefighters come and, you know, they were putting people on their rigs and heading out. So it was, yeah. I mean, it was just took it all in at once and slept like a baby that night. <laughs> yeah. Is it, do you just flip a switch? Like once you respond to a call, yeah. you're just, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Or yeah. do you still have to strategically think about step by step when you're, when you're on the scene? No, uh, actually, just yeah, it's a flip of a switch because sometimes you're just sitting there. It's uh, there's no calls. You're just kind of sitting there doing nothing, mm-hmm. and then something crazy is gonna pop off. So yeah, 
Yeah, you got to know how to flip that switch. And then once it's done, you got to turn it off. Yeah. So you've been in this position for three years, right? Mm -hmm. How long do you think it took before you can flip that switch um, instead of you being just so stressed and having to think so strategically like, okay, I need to do this. I need to do this. Talking about like, when is that switch? When it like, becomes more natural. I think, I think in the academy, we go through like simulations of that already. Oh, so it's pretty quick. Yep. Yeah. We'll, we'll go from sitting there, it's dead quiet. And then all of a sudden they ask you to do like tasks, like do this, do that, do that, do this. Yeah. And they mentally prepare you to do that. Yeah. So you gotta be able, I mean, a lot of mental preparation comes beforehand, right? With like practicing. Yeah. Um, while you're at home, you just think about scenarios and stuff like that. I'm sure that comes too with the medical field too, right? They got to mentally prepare. Oh yeah. Things out. Definitely. And you know, the longer you work in the medical field, I've been um, a licensed physical therapist um, just since last year. Mm -hmm. Congrats, and I'm by the way. I'm thank so you. I appreciate it. It was, it was definitely rigorous, mm -hmm. um, just as I'm sure as the the department was for you. But you just go through different situations. Um, it's good to be challenged because if not, you're just going day by day, yeah. just trying to get by with the shift. But when you know anything can happen, like any call can go onto mm -hmm. the radio, you have to be able to be prepared for it. Yeah, absolutely. Right? It's, it's it's happened multiple times when me and like I'll be with somebody and I'll be like, hey, man, it's a little quiet today. And then yeah. something like super crazy is going to happen. Oh, man. Oh, if in the hospital, no one ever says that it's a slow day. I know. It, the moment it, it is. Slips. Yeah, the moment you say it, there's just something bad that happens. Yeah. It's just... You have anything crazy happens. that happened at your hospital or any crazy stories? Um, so I work in the rehab department to where uh -huh. this is the next step where people go home. So let's say someone does get a gun, gunshot wound. Mm -hmm. They go to the hospital. They go to the acute care. You know, they may go through surgery. They may spend a couple of days in the, the recovery room. And then... Um, if they're not sent home, they get sent to rehab where we have to um, improve their mobility, make sure they're safe, make sure their home environment is safe. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we get homeless people and we have to figure out, okay, they don't have a home, but we can't just put them out in the streets. Right. Um, it's pretty sad because some hospitals will literally just put some of these patients out back in the streets. Um, but that's another, another story. Um, but I don't get to really see too many crazy things. Yeah. Um, I've been fortunate not to have to do any CPR yet. I, I have, okay. I have coworkers who have been working at the hospital for like 15, 20 years mm -hmm. and have never done CPR. Really? And I have coworkers who've been working a year and they've done CPR twice already. You think is that's just like position wise or it's, it's just luck of the draw? That the luck of the draw. Okay. Yeah. It could happen anytime. Um, even though I'm trained to do CPR, I just hope to never have to do it mm -hmm. um but i know i have the skills yeah just because i feel like mentally that will set me back quite a bit right you know um and I that's not even very like gruesome to to see but you yeah. probably see a lot of like things that you know through your eyes is just like wow i just yeah. saw that uh, yeah i think i say that at least once a month now <laughs> yeah yeah is it gotten to a point where it doesn't phase you anymore i, I think so you could probably ask my family that and it'll be like yeah yeah. You just say things and they're like, they're like, ah, that's so crazy. And I'm just like, yeah, that was probably a normal day. Yeah. Me too. Whenever I have friends or family that come up to me um, about like a medical condition, mm -hmm. whether they hurt their ankle or like their back and they, they're like super nervous and scared. Mm -hmm. I'm just so calm now because I know exactly what to do to help them. Yeah. But I think that's the, the most important thing is really staying calm as, um, you know, a police officer or a physical mm -hmm. therapist. Because if we're not calm, the people in front of you are going to freak out. Yeah, that's know? true. I mean, they're, they're, they're calling you or they're going to you for help. So yeah. 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 Sometimes you got to like act like you know what you're doing. Yeah, you just got to <laughs> fake it till you make it. Yeah. Um, let's go through a, a typical shift for you. What does that yeah. look like? How many hours do you work in a week? Yeah. Things like that. Um, usually it's 10 to 12, um, depending where you work. Um, you go in there, you do a brief with, you know, with your squad, see how the area is doing, what, what they want you know, to you to focus on. And then, um, my role right now is as a patrol officer is that we just take calls for service. Okay. So it's, uh, people get on 311 or 911. So we respond to those calls. Okay. Gotcha. Um, what are some of the most common medical situations mm -hmm. you respond to? The, the first thing that come into my mind is someone who overdoses just cause I kind of right. see that. I feel like I've, I flip on the news and that's mm -hmm. one of the first things I see. Is that more common or are there other medical conditions? 
I would say, yeah, it's, it's pretty common now, yeah. especially like, uh, fentanyl's on the rise. Mm. Um, people like to experiment with, uh, experiment with stuff. Yeah. Um, but I would say the most common is either people with severe mental illness who probably don't take medication or don't go to ther- therapy mm. or they're oh, just wow. very drunk. Yeah. So th- those are, those are one of the two daily things that, you know, we'll see. Yeah. How are you trained to distinguish what's what? Like whether someone is drunk or having a mental illness or so oh, forth. Okay. Um, so with being drunk, I mean, li- living in the city that we do, we, you know, you could either you smell it, it or, mm-hmm. you know, you just, you just know when someone's being drunk or acting like a fool. Right. But um, if it's like a mental illness, we went through like a CIT training at, I think it's called crisis intervention training. Yeah. So that, that was like two, three days of, um, uh, they had people who work in mental hospitals, um, people who are diagnosed with like schizophrenia and stuff oh, like that. Wow. They'll, they'll come in there and talk about, um, talk about like what goes on in their head and what, you know, it's like, it's alternate reality to some yeah. of them. So it, it's just for us to recognize it and to, I, I don't know, it's, it's all of it's different, right? Like with, with mm. mental illnesses. So yeah, you kind of have to be exposed to a lot of them to yeah. start to, distinguish right that. like I, I don't even know the medical terms i can just tell like kind of what what they have and then usually if um if we get to a point where we feel that they are suicidal like or they can't help themselves or they want to hurt others we have to call them and put them on a legal um not sure if you guys are familiar with those legal 2000s no let's go into that what so is it's, that? it's a it's a mental health hold so it's they like to call it arrests but it's not um, but we do have to force an individual to go to the hospital and go on a 72 hour hold Oh, so they, okay. they will go to um, they will go to a separate part of the hospitals when they will either put them on medication or go through uh, further screening on their um, their mental health. Okay, gotcha. So that's that's an option. Do you drive the patient or the, not the patient, but the person to the hospital? No, or do you no. let like paramedic? And, no, it's you know? it's going to be a medic. Oh, okay, yeah. our rig's going to get sent down to us, and then we have to write them up a paperwork. Um, and I'm, I know physicians. Um, I don't know if psychologists are able to put them on a mental health hold, but it's at that point they they're not free to just you know go out their way because someone has or someone who's allowed to has deemed them mentally unstable for that time period and need yeah. further evaluation. Yeah, have you had your fair share of people who are um, very um, like they just don't want to be on medical hold or they don't want to go oh, to the yeah. hospital? Yeah, how do you go about that? Yeah, there, there's been times where they're they're completely i guess losing it and they're trying to fight us and we have to put them on the gurney and put the soft straps on them mm. and there's been times where we had to call um a medic to sedate them on the spot because wow. they, they refuse to go but there's some instances where they're like i'm gonna kill myself or oh man I, i'm gonna go out and go stab people like you know we can't let people just on the street like mm-hmm. after they just said that you know you don't want to take that risk when they say stuff like that that's threatening do you mm-hmm. have to ask further questions or when does it are there anyone that's just like joking about it and then you're like okay don't joke about that let's yeah let's i mean you'll have those like drunk guys who's just trying to play around but then you'll you'll know the difference you'll know when they're being serious yeah. about it yeah yeah well, they'll believe like someone's out to get them or someone's gonna go kill them tonight or something like that like they'll say things like that along the lines yeah gotcha what other medical situations have you ran into Oh, that's a good question. Um, I have done from, like I said, gunshot wounds, people getting stabbed, um, overdoses. I've, I've I've had my fair share of those. Yeah. Um, and I guess uh, just people just getting hurt on the street. I mean, yeah. <laughs> we try to uh, attend to them as quick as possible, but our our uh, medical limitations are only so much until we have to call a professional. Yeah. Is it hard to empathize with patients or I'm so used to saying patients because no, that's like I mean, all they, I see. They are patients. Though. Yeah. How do you empathize with those people when, you know, they're, they're kind of, you go into their home or mm-hmm. in the streets and you just see them how they are. Yeah. But you also have to see them as people who Absolutely. might make mistakes in their life yeah. and not just someone who is doing this consistently. Yeah. Like, how do you, how do you connect with them? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, you have to think that they're just people too. And, mm-hmm. and it could be your brother, your sister, your your mom or dad. So you got to treat them all the same until they give you a reason that, you know, you have to separate from being a human being who's there to help them and being a police officer. 
Yeah. So there's certain times that, you know, people will call us and say, hey, like, my brother's acting a certain way, right? Like, I'm, I'm afraid of him. And now we have to dig deep into that. Like, like, why are you afraid of him? Like, what, what is he doing that's making you feel that way? Like, what, what can I do here now? What kind of resources can I provide him? Is being a police officer at this moment more beneficial to him or being like a whole human being and actually sitting there and caring about, you know, their whole, their whole family and, and see how we can help out with that. Yeah. And I, I can't even imagine having to flip the switch between being a human being and being a police officer mm-hmm. because you also want to make sure that they're comfortable. Mm-hmm. But if you're just 100% police officer or 100% human, it's hard for them to trust you that you're mm-hmm. actually trying to take care of them. Yeah. Right. Because they, they want to trust you at the at yeah. the end of the day because they probably can't take care of themselves. They're yeah. probably vulnerable at that time. So yeah. I'm sure that must be hard. Yeah. I mean, there's been times where it's like we had to deal with children, you know, like getting sexually assaulted and stuff mm. like that. Like there's training that's provided to us, but then there's also verbal cues you want to look at, right? Like you don't, there's a little kid, you don't want to stand over them while you talk to them. Cause like you're in a, you're in a uniform and that's, that's scary, you know, yeah. to everybody. Like you wear it every day and it's not scary to you, but to them, they don't see that every day. So, yeah. I mean, at those times you got to empathize with them, you know, get on their level, talk to them. Yeah. But those also been times when like people are actually hurt, right? You'll have, they'll have like a black guy and you're sitting there trying to attend to them and they're going to tell you to F off. Yeah. Like, hey, we don't want you here. Be like, like someone called us here to, you know, to help you Do out. Do you but, keep pushing for that then? Like. Or at, at once cer- they say no, you're like, okay, I'll, I'll leave you behind. There, there's a certain point um, until we find a legal reason to be there and that we have to control the situation. Like, you know, someone has committed a crime and and obviously you need to remove that person from that certain spot because now we're legally obligated to. Then, yeah. then, then we'll push the issue. Yeah. But then there's been times when people just fought each other because mm, they got yeah. heated and then they're like, okay. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you right. guys do you. Is there any difference when you're seeing somebody who's a lot older versus like you said, you, sometimes you see children. Yeah. How do you manage yeah. that difference? Sometimes when they're older, you just have to connect with them with some way. Um, there's been times when like, I'll talk to a guy who's, you know, feeling suicidal, like the, they'll, they'll call us. I'm feeling suicidal. Now I'm talking to like a, like a 60, 50 year old man saying they're suicidal with all this life experience. Right. Mm-hmm. So I just, I try to tell them, you know, I, I'll introduce myself, tell them a little bit of my background so that, you know, they're more comfortable with me. It's like, it's like, you know, when you get, when you talk to patients and you want yeah. them to feel comfortable with you. Right. It's so, so different between age groups for sure. Yeah. I mean, and with children, I don't know, that's, that's a little harder. Mm-hmm. I try to call people who's, uh, you know, more, uh, more well-versed. In that. Yeah. I always say that. Uh, you'll never find me working with pediatrics because I'm just not the type to work with younger ch- people or yeah. children. I love working with, you know, um, young adults and older adults. Mm-hmm. It's in the hospital. It's just so it's so different. But in the part of the hospital that I work, we don't really take pediatrics. Mm-hmm. I think the youngest we would take is like 16 years old. Oh, but wow. that's like in special special cases. Okay. I think the last. Um, pediatric patient that I worked with, it was like this 16 year old who um, basically had almost like a stroke, had autism um, and had a lot of mental um, disorder. So Mm -hmm. it was a very difficult thing to do to the point where I had to step back and just bring in my coworker who was well versed in like autism because autism alone is really hard to work with Mm -hmm. because you have to find different ways to interact with them sometimes they're non-verbal yeah right have you ever uh, experienced like work uh, like with children that may be non-verbal or like they they don't know how to communicate with you how do you do that on the outside of the law enforcement capacity like i told you i I worked as a a paraprofessional for special education Mm -hmm. yeah well there's students who's non-verbal there's uh there's some who's just completely quiet but you know they're they're well exceeding all their classmates yeah but but yeah and autism sometimes it's hard to tell right yeah there's autism doesn't look like one thing yeah yeah do you have any good and happy stories that you responded to maybe a call that you expected going in like oh man this is going to be a tough one but by the end of the call or the night you're like wow that was very fulfilling Ooh, medical wise or just medical or non-medical either way Ooh. 
a good question. Yeah. Because I go through that as a physical therapist. Yeah. I go through a patient, whether it's like a, an evaluation. So part of my job as a physical therapist is I do evaluations mm-hmm. where I assess, you know, head to toe, their mobility, how they're moving. And sometimes I'll just walk by the room before I do my evaluation and I'll see them, you know, are they, are they laying down? Are they sitting? How is their posture? Mm-hmm. I can already kind of tell by um, body language. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as much as I don't want to say it, there's, there's a little bit of like, um, like judgment already because I, I need a clinical reasoning. Like I want to expect the, the worst in somebody because I have to um, essentially grade them on their movement mm-hmm. um, in the lowest way possible. But sometimes I'll be done with an evaluation and like, wow, that was probably the best patient I've ever had. They were yeah. so nice. Has anything caught you off guard with anybody that you've... Oh, yeah. With? So going into this profession, um, it was the height of, you know, with all the George Floyd stuff going on. Yeah. So it seemed like, you know, it's not the right time to be a cop at that time. Yeah. But I still, you know, still went and did it with, with the mindset that I want to make people happy. I want to do the community right. And, you know, I want to serve. Uh, surprisingly, the the city that that we that we work in uh, likes their cops. So mm. we'll we'll randomly get like our our coffee paid for, or we'll be in oh, line nice. trying to eat lunch, and then the people ahead of us already paid and stuff oh, wow. like that. It's, yeah, depends where you are in town. Yeah, so, I've been great, and that so. can be a big difference whether oh, yeah. you're in one part of town, yeah, or the other. It's a it's a flip of a switch. Yeah, are there any co-workers that you've had to struggle working with because do you ride with somebody sometimes always or are you sometimes riding alone in the car most of the time you ride alone oh okay. but you show up to calls for service with other people oh um, but luckily i have not i'm not work with people that i just despise okay i, I like i kind of like everyone that i work with okay i may not agree on everything that they do but at the end of the day we get you know we get that job done. Yeah, we do it legally, and everyone goes like yeah. home safely. That's that's all that matters to me, honestly. Right. What are some traits that you think is important to have as a, a patrol officer? Like kind of like that, you know, mm-hmm. having just uh, the mindset that we're a team. Yeah. I think else? I think first and foremost is just kindness with other people. You, you mm-hmm. have to care to last because mm. there's people who just maybe in there to get a paycheck, and that's you're not going to last. There's you know you go through so many things emotionally physically that you know just going there for a paycheck is not going to be enough yeah definitely not it's not and i would guess too um you can't trust everybody (laughs) yeah the moment you get your guard down you might get hurt or someone else might get hurt so yeah i think those are the two things is it much harder to open up to a coworker then because you're you need to be guarded at the same time no i think it's much easier okay like i've known some people for less than a year and i felt like i've known them forever like you know like i've known you yeah so it's i I think it's easier because you go through seeing things with other people and you end up experiencing the same things and you talk about those yeah those hard things um yeah it definitely a lot easier do you feel like you get closer to a, a co-worker whether you're just in the car talking to each mm-hmm. other or do you feel like you get closer to someone after a call that's been tough and you talk through that call i think a little bit of both okay um when you're with someone you know that you're like two feet away from them every night, um, yeah. you'll definitely get close to them. But I think definitely after a really tough call is when you know you 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 get really close after that. Because I've I've received there was an instance that someone that I, I knew was within the same group that I knew she uh, she was shot and she was hurt, and someone from my work my work group. Cause I don't work with that person anymore. He, mm. he called me, he was like sobbing on the phone and Man. you know, he, he wanted to talk. So yeah. And you get real close in that, in oh, that yeah. sense. Yeah. Everyone, everyone opens up to each other, which yeah. is really good. Yeah. What percentage of your day or shift typically do you feel like is more positive and what percent do you feel mm. like is more negative, whether it's mentally, physically, because you know, as, as a physical therapist, sometimes I think of my, the labor that I'm doing, the physical labor, mm-hmm. lifting people up can be sometimes negative because mm-hmm. of how I feel at the end of the day. But sometimes that's also good because I'm like, I feel like I'm working out, but how much of it is that balance for you? I think it's just 
perception at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. I know some people who's like super negative, just want to cry about every little thing, but yeah. I sit there and I'm, I want to be grateful for everything. Yeah. I want to be happy. You know, I'm tell myself I'm happy. I'm here and I have, I have a job. I'm here to help people regardless if they're having a bad day or not, but mm -hmm. try to put smiles on people's faces. Right. Cause I think one thing that we can relate with is many times we're going to see someone at their lowest. Yes. And how can we match them when yep. they're at the lowest, right? We have to provide encouragement, mm -hmm. you know, spread peace and joy and, yeah. and, and kindness. Um, I've definitely had coworkers who um, are like that. And then there's some who just feed into kind of the negativity. Mm -hmm. and I just don't understand it. Yeah. Like how can, how can you have somebody who's near death experience mm -hmm. and not being an encourager, right? Yeah. But when you go through a long day, like a 12 hour shift, I'm sure that can be pretty tough sometimes, you know? Yeah. Because we're, we're human. We're not going to be 100%, you know, peaceful and joyful. Mm -hmm. There's going to be parts of it where like, wow, that was yeah. that was a lot a lot harder. I mean, especially those days too. Like you may have not gotten sleep the night before or something bothered you or you may be fighting with your significant other. Yeah, you Right. It, it really affects like your work. But once you put that uniform on, I'm sure yeah. you try your best to get in the mindset. Similar for me, like when I put my scrubs on in the morning, mm -hmm. I have to be kind of, in that mindset we're like okay this isn't about me anymore for today mm -hmm. this is about for somebody else who needs it more than i do because even right. if i'm having a bad day if i wear this uniform it's because i've done the training for somebody mm -hmm. like i don't wear the scrubs for myself yep. right and i think that's a, an important trait to have for any medical professional or like a patrol officer yep. like you let's go into any misconceptions about being a patrol officer like mm -hmm. what are what are some things that you've heard, you know, whether it's family, friends talking about your position that you're like, mm -hmm. no, that's not even true at all. Yeah, um, I guess one of the most is that we're just we're there to lock people up every day. It's not completely true because sometimes it's not even worth you know taking someone to jail for certain things. So mm -hmm. we kind of we have that leeway of giving them warnings and stuff like that. Yeah, that and uh, that we like to. Uh, profile <laughs> yeah there's a difference between you know racial profiling which isn't you know that's that's a no-no yeah and then there's you know criminal profiling yeah which, which is its own separate thing yeah definitely um is there anything that you would want to mention race wise i know mm -hmm. um as like a, a general police officer you know with the news they always like to talk about race like mm. what ha what have you experienced yeah you know as like a, an asian male in yeah. this position yeah definitely you know i'm a minority in in that space um i like to use that sometimes as an advantage um you know i've, I've heard times when it's like someone would say i don't want to talk to that cop he's white i'm gonna talk to you i'm mm. like okay like we're gonna treat you the same exact way and then right. you, they're not gonna like what i say and they're gonna go right back they're gonna to go the, back yeah yeah it's like, can I talk to the manager? But but the manager says the same exact thing yeah, to you. Yeah, exactly. It's like you could have just trusted yeah. the cop initially. Yeah. And what's yeah. a good thing, too, is that we have body cams. So mm. we're uh, we're held to that standard that, yeah. you know, you can't act you can't act all crazy. You can't, yeah. you can't say certain things, which which is really good. Yeah. Because, you know, you'll keep those bad apples out. Right. Just, just out of curiosity, and I don't know if you can answer this, mm -hmm. um, do those body cams have to be on all the time? And how it is, if it's on all the time, how is it even charged? <laughs> like, if it's on your yeah. body, do you just switch it out for another yeah. camera? No, so it's um, per policy, at least where I work. Yeah. Um, every time you make citizen contact, it has to be on. So as soon as you hit that button, it goes back 30 seconds. So it's not like I just got to you and then I turn it on. It's going to go back 30 seconds when I was still in the car. Oh, how does that even... That's pretty cool. Honestly, I guess it's always kind of recording mm. until you press that button and then it'll save that certain part. Yeah. And then when do you turn it off when you're like uh, back into the car all yeah. done? Yeah. Or once you're talking to your partners, um, you can you can turn it off. How long do they usually last the recording? Because um, I'm sure you've had you, really long calls. Yeah, you could. You know what? During a 12 hour shift, that's when it'll start dying. Oh, okay. Then, so it lasts pretty yeah, long. Yeah, when we head back to the substation, we dock the battery and the camera, and then it uploads onto the system. Okay. Yeah. What are some of the other, like, little details that, like, myself would never know? Like, the camera situation that mm -hmm. you have to, like, dock it. Are there anything else 
in your shift that is so natural to you that you just do it but to someone like me like i would never even think about that oh you become a professional multitasker okay in what way you have to look at the cat or you have to be able to read details of calls on the screen while you're driving to that spot while listening to your radio while making sure no one's like crawling up next to you so <laughs> yeah. you you know you're multitasking a lot so you're always on guard i'm always on the edge oh my yeah. goodness but yeah. you got to know how to you know how to balance that out or kind of kind of chill yeah or else you know you're going to be tired by the end of the day yeah do you think learning the codes and the numbers was one of the toughest thing because i oh, just like, me thinking about it like whenever, the radio traffic stuff? yeah oh, like if yeah. you have to call a no, like use a number to to tell another person or if mm-hmm. they're giving you a number yeah. Like, how did that, how long did that take before you're like, okay, yeah. I know that right off the top of my so head? So, I've never been like good at memory stuff. So, <laughs> I was notorious at forgetting. <laughs> so, do you just ask your partner, like, hey, what was that? <laughs> no, through repetition. Oh, okay. Yeah. Just like, you know, when, when you study for, for things or yeah. you perform tasks on your patients, it's repetition and knowing what to look for and what to listen to. You probably have to know all that before you're alone in the car, right? I would just, I would hope that people. Yeah. <laughs> Because if not, you're kind of in, in trouble. But then the, you will know like the most important things and to listen to. Like if someone needs help, you'll know exactly what they call out. And you're like, oh, yep, need to go to that. Most common ones. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And um, I, it's pretty funny. I just randomly like watched this video on, I think it was YouTube, mm-hmm. where I think it was like a parody or something. It was like two cops in the car and... It, the the guy in the passenger seat was a trainee mm-hmm. and the driver all of a sudden stopped and he was like oh i just got shot in the the chest like where are we and it oh yeah it, like within two seconds like oh you don't know where we're at i'm dead i think i just saw that too yeah yeah i was like that's pretty funny but i'm like wow yeah. that that's it, pretty it's a legit. real thing because for me like when i'm driving i pay no attention to where mm-hmm. i'm at like i let the google maps lead me yeah so whenever you're driving you're you're, you probably have to be like okay i know exactly where i'm at yeah i think i think my wife gets like kind of annoyed with me sometimes because we'll just be driving down the street and i'm like that car's unregistered really (laughs) like "Hmm, that car's up to no good yeah what yeah it's hyper vigilance at that point yeah so i'll i kind of know where i'm at at all times it's kind of i think it's kind of annoying yeah for me too like i tell myself like when you're off the clock you you kind of can't what do you just tell your coworkers? about that or like whenever you're driving mm-hmm. and you're like oh that car is unregistered but i'm off the clock i'm not going to do anything about it is that typical? oh yeah. yeah 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 just leave it on yeah there's crime before we did this job and there'll always be crime after so yeah no for sure all the can't all do the in between yeah can't do it all yeah so you've been in this position for three years it's quite a bit of, it's a long time mm-hmm. what would you say to someone who wants to be in your position i would say it's a tough time i would say i mean especially with a lot of negativity out there but it's a rewarding job um especially if you don't like to sit i guess in an office all day you want something different every day and if you're a thrill seeker it's definitely the right thing for you yeah definitely um what is one thing that you would lead someone away like someone who's an aspiring patrol officer but you're like okay Mm -hmm. let's sit down let's be real this this and this this is probably why you shouldn't What are some of those things? That's actually something I've had a talk with someone recently. Oh, okay. I think it comes with age and life experience. You can't be someone who's never left, like, the house, never had any real life experience and want to become a cop because you're going to go out there and deal with people who's been married for, like, 20 years, and now you're telling them how to make up and how to fix their relationship. Right. Or now you're telling someone what to do and now you know people's not going to listen to you when you've never experienced it yeah when you never experienced it yourself so i think you got to go through a little bit of life experience yeah whether it's military or doing a certain job for a certain amount of time but i mean that that all comes with how someone carries himself Mm -hmm. and and talks to people yeah would you say this position is not for someone who's to go into it first like they should go i don't know emt route Mm -hmm. or other paramedic and then get to this point would, would that be pretty fair to say i would say do a ride along uh, at least five times a ride along is when like a like a civilian like you um would just fill out a piece of paper you do a little background check and you get to ride with us for a full day oh how common is that uh pretty common I had a few few buddies of mine did it um 
either they love it or they don't, but some must come back for a second go around and yeah. a blast. Is it only for those trying to be in that position no. or is it just like if someone is curious? Yep. Solely curious. And we've had, um, like we've had chaplains that we actually have chaplains for, oh, for okay. the department too. Yeah. They'll, they'll ride with us. They kind of want to see what we do so that they can speak to that. Yeah. Um, media will sometimes ride with us yeah um or just any of your buddies that want to ride with you can, that's pretty cool that. yeah you try to scare them away <laughs> no definitely not you just try I, to encourage them i try to give them the most real like raw aspect of the job and there's been times where it's a little boring and there's some where they definitely had their heart pumping <laughs> yeah i've had my fair share of people uh shadowing me and following me oh, in cool. the, the hospital and I tell them straight, like, there's some times when it's super interesting. Like, we're mm-hmm. going to work with a patient with a stroke, and we're going to walk them. They're going to go from not walking to walking. And then there's some, where, like, the boring parts is, like, documenting. Like, sitting in yeah. the computer, just documenting what I did. Oh, yeah. And they're just sitting there, like, just yeah. just chilling. I'm like, this is probably the boring part. What percentage would you say is paperwork and actually hands-on with your patients? So in an, I work eight-hour shifts. Okay. Um, in an eight-hour shift, I would say an hour and a half to two hours of it is just sitting in a computer and documenting. Okay. Um, obviously, we can't document while we're treating a patient. Mm-hmm. So usually our treatments are 30 minutes or an hour long. Um, so I usually start my shift at 8 a.m. I'll treat from 8 to like 11 a.m., and then 11 to 11.30, I'll document. Um, and I try to I try to be caught up with my morning notes. Yeah. And then I'll have lunch. And then same thing in the afternoon. I'll treat some patients. And then I'll document at the end of the, my day. Um, but honestly, um, I've gotten to a mentality where I can't think of documenting as the boring part of, of uh, physical therapy. Mm-hmm. Because documenting is actually one of the most important parts of, of physical therapy. Because sometimes what can happen is... Uh, like hospital corporations or um, insurance companies, they audit our notes. Mm -hmm. Let's say you're my patient and I treat you today and I write a document Um, and your insurance company is is like suing my hospital. They're going to take a look at my note from today and I think it's up to like seven years that they can audit. So like six years from now, they're going to take a look at the note that I wrote today and it, they they can sue for like negligence or oh, wow. or fraud or malpractice. So if I'm just nonchalant about my documentation, mm-hmm. it can really bite me um, later down the road. So, um, you know, when I first started working, I I just thought of documenting. It was, it was just so boring. Mm-hmm. But now I'm just so hyper focused when I'm yeah. documenting because I could potentially lose my license. You know, right. by the end of it. Um, but. Every, every part of my job I, I love, mm-hmm. um, and I think it's important for any medical profession because burnout is super real. Oh, yeah. What is burnout like in the police department yeah. world? I think it can come at different points of your career. Uh, I know guys that's been on 15, 20 years who's burnt out, and there's some guys who's been on a year and has been burnt out. Mm. I've definitely gone through that point when I felt burnout too, but I think it's how you handle yourself at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, The habits that you have, um, you know, whether it's getting exercise, talking to family. Right. um, Not doing things work-related will will keep you from burning out. Yeah. Over your time in the last three years, have you gotten better at shutting off work when you clock out? Um, Yeah, I I would say so. Um, I definitely, you know, tell my family stories and stuff like that. But I definitely try to keep all the feelings I had during work out of there, but there's some that you just can't control and there's some things that will get to you. Yeah. That's one thing I, um, I like vowed to myself, um, with my wife too, as well mm-hmm. is even though I had the toughest patient for the day, I'm not going to go to sleep thinking about it or being angry because then I'll put it off on her mm-hmm. or I'll put it off on, you know, somebody else. Um, so I think I've gotten better yeah. at just, clocking out maybe in my car i'll I'll kind of just spend five minutes just sitting Mm -hmm. if it's a hard day i'm like i just need to breathe i just need to relax and then i go home and it just you know i I try not to talk about work too much unless it's a positive thing like if i have a a positive note or if i had a really good patient Mm -hmm. you know i'll tell my wife and everything um because i want to fill my mind with positivity you know throughout the day um because i don't do too well going to sleep and i'm like in my head about work 
Like, right. And I think th- that's the reason why I chose to be in a hospital, actually. Hospital is one of those things in physical therapy where you don't bring work home. Mm-hmm. Um, there's other um, settings like outpatient where you, do, you treat patients at the clinic, you document at the clinic, you go home and you take work home. And that's just not the, the life I want. Yeah. You know, it, it could be too much, especially, you know, we're young and we have the energy to do so, mm-hmm. but it doesn't mean that we have to overwork ourselves Yeah, because burnout, burnout, like you said, burnout can happen whether you're, you know, a veteran in the game or you just graduated. Yeah. Depends on your, on your outlook. Absolutely. You, know you can't, you can't let your life consume, you know, what you do for a living. Yeah. You gotta be able to separate that. I completely agree. Right. It, when I was going through physical therapy school in my mind, I thought of uh, graduating and becoming a physical therapist as mm-hmm. my, like my highest platform. Like once I achieve that, yeah. I'm completely set. My first six months of working um, in the hospital, I started to realize that my career shouldn't be my entire life. Right. Like I should have hobbies. I should have things that I like. I should spend time with family and friends. Because if all I do and think about is work, it's just gonna burn me out. Yeah. What are some of those like hobbies that you do to kind of unwind from work yeah so um i played i played hockey a lot prior going into um oh nice to being law enforcement but unfortunately my, my schedule the way it was set up i had to take a pause on that okay but i've been lucky that the profession i chose kind of went in line with some of the hobbies i have like firearms oh, okay i like to play with guns a lot and yeah luckily you know that's part of the job so yeah kind of kind of blessed that it's mixed into work so yeah bro i've never gone shooting but i i want to you've never gone shooting dude i've never and i and i want oh, to man yeah i might have to change that <laughs> let's go <laughs> and i yeah. love seeing people's reaction shooting for the first time because you get like this dopamine rush yeah. and they always have a big smile on bro them. i'm gonna be shaking with my hands and i'm like no it's I, only fine yeah i need the, the my, recall is gonna like <laughs> my uh just my sister-in-law yeah so uh they just moved here and she's kind of like a sheltered like lady yeah and i was you know showing her my things and i put like a like a bullet on her hand like around and yeah. she was like shaking yeah. <laughs> i was like hey, we need to change that yeah it's like don't put a but don't put a gun yeah. on your hand she's gonna start shaking but i definitely want to like going yeah. out in the, in the range um i think that'd be super cool i used yeah. to kind of be against it for a long time really but now i'm like it would be so why, cool why were you so against it at one point you know, I don't know. I, I honestly, to be real, I thought of it as a negative thing. Mm-hmm. I thought of it as like, why would you have a gun in your hand if uh, you're just like shooting a, a target? Like, mm-hmm. why? And for the longest time, that was my mentality. And I kind of had this misconception of, of, of people who do that. Mm-hmm. And I like judged a lot of people who did that. Mm-hmm. And then my, my thinking started to change. It's like, okay, this might be like, I can see why people do this as a, as a hobby. Like if it's a safe environment mm-hmm. and you know what you're doing and you're not just out there like going ham on a target, like outrageous. Yeah. But if it's done the right way. Was there I a certain thing that changed that or, or that was just kind of a like a realization moment? That realization. I think it was just okay. maturity. Like okay. uh, growing up, um, I just thought of different things, different ways. I started to put a lot of respect on um, like frontline workers, mm-hmm. um, like EMTs, police officers, um, and things like that, because uh, once I got into my field as a physical therapist, I started to feel a lot of responsibility for others. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, you know, these these cops and, and police, they also have a responsibility and they're doing a job. So how am I going to judge them right. for owning a gun? You know, and just because I, you know, uh, have no experience with it doesn't mean I should hate on it. Yeah. So it was just kind of like a maturity thing growing yeah. up. Um, but I'm glad I'm, I'm thinking that way now. I, yeah. it's kind of hard when sometimes I'll see, I'll see the news and there's, you know, shootings. Those are always oh, yeah. kind of tough. Does that ever still yeah. like hit so, you hard? So I think so, what people have to realize is that cops or people who like guns don't want violence as much as the next person. It's more of a preventative measure to, I guess, make themselves feel good, or it's a tool that they grew up with. Like, you know, people in the South hunted all their lives. Yeah. And, and had that tool and you know to, to make a livelihood you know whether to kill animals because they're hunting or that they had to protect their property because they had animals trying to go on their livestock so yeah 
yeah, I think people need to go with a more open mindset. And uh, for to, sure, yeah, if they want to shoot a gun, make sure they go with a uh, someone who knows what someone doing. who knows <laughs> yeah. what they're doing. Yeah, well, we'll have to go sometime. You'll have to show me the ropes. Oh right? yeah. Um, kind of last question: Is there anything you want to share in terms of your favorite experience with being yeah. a patrol officer the last three years? Like the first thing that comes to your head, like, oh wow, that's when I think about what I love about my job. That is it. Mm-hmm. I think is uh, jumping into a patrol car in a uniform uh, during my work days, and there's actually people that want to just sit there and talk to you, and you know, talk to you outside of work. They just just want to like get to know you or see how you're doing and you know that that brings a smile to my face yeah when you're not facing you know people's bad moments in their lives right yeah i think that's my favorite thing yeah i'm sure it's a great feeling every single time you put that uniform on because you're serving others and a lot of that probably came from you serving in in the military right kind of just following you through life oh yeah yeah there's a lot of veterans at work with the department too so yeah there's a lot of camaraderie that way. Yeah, definitely. Um, last question. I like to ask all my guests this. Mm-hmm. So the last three years you've been a patrol officer. What is next for you? What does life look like? Ooh. Do you want to stay as a patrol officer? Yeah. Do you want to venture out in different yeah. avenues? What is that like? I've had kind of two avenues I kind of want to go into. Um, uh, everywhere in the country is facing a recruitment problem. Mm. So recently a supervisor of mine kind of pushed me through that route to do a bit of recruiting, speak upon, you know, the positives of, of doing this workplace. Um, and maybe become a sergeant one day, hopefully okay. lead the troops okay. out there. So, Yeah. What is this uh, sergeant lifestyle like? I, I have no idea of what um, like it, the rankings are. It's kind of like your, your next step in your supervisory role. You'll have people underneath you. Okay. Um, I don't, it's like whoever would be like one above you would basically be a sergeant. Okay. So you have a sergeant above you mm-hmm. right now, yep. and that's kind of what you would yeah. potentially want to mm-hmm. go into. Yep. Gotcha. What about um, non-work stuff, non-career? What non-career are some things you want to – any hobbies you want to go into? Ooh. I know you played hockey. Yeah. Um, do you want to go back into that when, when time permits? I do, yeah. I'm, I'm trying. I think. Yeah. That and just be a good, good father, good husband. And Absolutely. And just stay happy. That's that's my number one goal. And yeah. I plan on keeping it that way. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. Well, it's been really nice to talk to you. I, I yeah. honestly, I thank you for your service. I think oh, no. a lot of people, <laughs> you know, it. there's a lot of, you know, things going on the, around the world, mm-hmm. a lot of perceptions, but I'm really glad to sit, you know, face to face with someone who's really in this position. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I hope this spreads a lot of awareness for anybody watching, you know, to really just respect those who are really trying to save your life and not make it worse. So I I appreciate you. Anything else that you want to, you know, say in terms of anybody watching? Sure. Um, first of all, I appreciate you for having me here. Yeah. And I guess I'll end it on a note that, um, God created policemen so firefighters can have heroes too. Let's go. (laughs) Come on. Hey man, preach that. (laughs) Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah.